So today, I'm going to go into kind of things that I've uh, skipped for the last couple of days. So things like uh, uh, how Linux and system are, really, are organized, um, what program actually is, what Linux actually is, uh, those kind of kind of high level but kind of in-depth questions. So a little overview of going to what compile what programs do that are compiled. So C, Fortran, C, um, and Unix mainly C. Windows C. Uh, what the role of the kernel is in all this. So what I mean when I say Linux or what Linux is. And something else that I've kind of been skipping over with programs, the fact that there's a concept of ownership, the fact that there's a concept of users. Um, and so going into the repercussions of that, why that's useful, examples where that's useful, um, such as with files. And last thing, and I'm going to try to segue this stuff together, even though it's a little bit of random topics, what the um, different folders are on a Linux unit system. So I've been CD the slide <coughs> TC without really explaining what's going on there. Um, and I just wanted to address that briefly. So first thing is what is a program? What are these things that we're typing in um, that's being run? And First way to look at it is it's code that a computer understands. So to really get a sense of that, I'm going to take a look at the echo command. So that's a slash bin slash echo. Just LSing it to show you where it is. If we open it, let's say we use cat. This is usually a bad idea for a program. As you can see, terminal doesn't really know what to make sense of it. So I don't know if Max have this program um, by default without Xcode, but Astro One does, and many Linux distributions do. The um, XXD takes this and just shows you the ones and zeros made out of. And if we run this, something horribly long, my first instinct is always to press the up arrow and run this through less. And you see something a bit still horribly wrong, or horribly long, but at least you can scroll through it. What this is showing are line numbers the ones and zeros that make up the file, and what that looks like if you think of that as text. It's not text, which is why you have a bunch of symbols it doesn't understand, and puts a dot in. And the couple in the beginning, um, these ones and zeros, and <coughs> the ones and zeros that are normally representatives, ELF. That's the type of file this is. I'm on Sigwin and on Mac, so it'll be different. Um, but these are ones and zeros that the processor understands, and as well as um, Linux. So this is nothing you would ever program in. Or I guess you could in the 70s and there'd be legends about yet. Um, <laughs> even then, in the 50s, people were starting to make programming languages to avoid having to deal with this. But the two dots, you said that they always have a different number here. Yeah, so dots just represent something that um, that aren't part of what's called the ASCII code for going from a generally you will find that it's all the next line it's the same, Yeah, so you notice all for the next line all of them are zeros except this one, which is a bunch of zeros and a one, and neither of those are representable as uh, principal characters. So that's why they're all place with dots in the right. Um, but they mean something. 
get a sense of what that means. And this, I know, will not work on a Mac. Object dump takes the program. I'm going to pipe this to less right away. Takes the program and makes a little kind of mnemonic out of this. So instead of a bunch of zeros and ones, it shows you um, the code in a language that you use when ta talking about the processor. So for instance, there were things that specified file formats, and things that specified different sections of this executable, and so part of it different on different machines. This represents bad, no idea why. This represents an INSP, in this language that's mnemonic. <coughs> you can see these two lines are represented by the number 78 and something else. And so this mnemonic for the ones and zeros are you, that the processor understands, this is assembly. What C compilers typically do is they take your C code and turn it into this. C++ compilers also. Um, Fortran may do this too, or go directly to the binary. But this is, so, so this is what the compiled programs, um, one way to look at them. Still kind of a painful way to look at it, because you have to realize um, what these codes mean based on what processor you're running them on. So I'm running them on uh, some, an Intel 64 bits processor compatible. Um, if you're running them on your on your cell phone, for instance, these codes will look totally different. So no one does this because of that. Also, you have a lot of stuff that relates to actually things in the C library. Um, this hash function from the C library. I press page down. These are for loading libraries. So there's a lot of kind of cruft here for loading libraries. To go to a really simple program that's in assembly but doesn't have all the C library stuff. This is an example of doing Hello World on Linux without doing um, without loading the C library. Now, even these operations, so this doesn't show the bytecode, the um, the actual code that the processor understands, but even these operations of moving um, dollar sign is just the uh, actual value. So dollar sign one is just the number one. This is moving it to think of the things with the percent sign, like variables. Um, what variables you have, where you put them in to do certain operations depends on the processor. So even in assembly, you haven't totally abstracted this. Um, but this is a simple way do hello world. And the way it works is by moving things to these kind of variables in the processor and the syscall command that I'll talk, talk about in a bit. And then exiting and calling syscall again. What syscall is, syscall actually does what you want it to. Um, in this case, right into the screen. Um, as well as any other kind of hardware manipulation. What a C program does, what a Fortran program does, is a lot of its own math, and then doing these, sys these syscalls, system calls, to tell the, um, to tell another program what to do to the hardware. The way Linux is set up, the way Unix is set up, is that you have your programs, and they interact via system calls, some big program, and that interacts with the hardware. Linux is this part of it. So all the programs run on it, that's from the GNU project or from other projects. Um, BSD refers to both the kernel and a lot of the programs run on it. Um, 
that basically all these programs, all the programs require a kernel between it and the hardware. A way to see this on both Mac and Linux. On Mac, I'd like you to run this, eTrust. On Linux, I can wait. Sorry, typo, my part. On Linux, S trace. This is a kind of nice, if verbose, way of seeing what a program is doing by seeing what it's telling the kernel to do. This lists the system calls. So does everyone see something that looks kind of like this? Not for that. Not for that. Citing D trace yeah. in the error. It says it requires Mine does that too. I don't know. Well, I trace to it. Yeah. I don't know why that works. I did it before on your computer. But, okay, so on the Mac, try this and it'll ask you for a password. Um, here's actually kind of an interesting thing. So, does that work? It, it should look a little nicer. No, it didn't. Uh, oh, okay. So a lot of the things it prints out. I'm going to scroll up with my mouse a bit. A lot of the things it prints out is things like for the libraries, this ld.so, loading, um, trying to get a sense of what. Libraries are loaded already. Loading the C library with open. And a lot of this mprotect and mmap is mapping memory so that you can refer to things in RAM that are really in the C library. So a lot of those um, assembly stuff is to set this, um, set up your access to the C library. The interesting line here Towards the end, this line, write is a system call that takes the file descriptor, one is standard output, hello world is what it's writing to that file descriptor, and 12 is the length of hello world. And before it even does the <coughs> closing parentheses, the echo program prints out hello world. So you're seeing the system calls happen as they happen. Um, if you have a, a program that's crashing because you can't find the file, this is a way to see what it's trying to open. A useful man. So I said man pages are a useful help for a lot more, a, a, a lot of things in, in Linux and Unix, not just commands. Um, Man two, two refers to the category, and then one of these system calls will tell you what they do. So, for instance, the right system call oh, is not installed in this. Now, in my normal computer, it is, and you can see the file descriptor and see and see the um, what you want to actually write and how big it is. Likewise, any of the other system calls. If you're really curious what they do. Um, so what programs are is a lot of doing math on the processor and calling system calls to control your speakers, control your console, write, write to files, read files. 
that's essentially what the cloud programs do and how Linux plays into that. Linux is just the thing that actually does the thing that programs want to do. So. Any questions? On a Mac, um, so Mac is obviously more than just the kernel, it's the um, program that comes with, it's a graphical interface. The kernel on there is called um, Mock or Darwin. Apple calls it Darwin. Um, but yeah, that's the role of that program on a Mac. Questions? Okay. So kind of segueing from here to the next topic. The um, one of the things that Unix was created to do was to have uh, allow multiple users to use one computer. That's uh, so you're from here to the wall. Not the cheapest, not the cheapest computer to make, like one for everyone who wanted to use it. So Unix was designed from the start to be multi-user, as well as running multiple programs. The way this is done, and the way, since many of you have logged into these computers uh, remotely or locally, is by having a concept of well, users. So, so I'm going to take my screen. So you can tell what user you are. A lot of um, prompts will tell you before the at sign. Another way to say, who am I? Tell your username. The who command tells you something similar. It tells you um, who is logged in and how they're logged in. And you can tell it, um, I don't know, this is traditional. If you give it any two words, if you give it any two words, it tells you who you are. But if you have anyone else on your system, say, I log into Astro One, and this is using the SSH commands. If I type who, there's a lot of people. Um, I don't know. Who rules here? Shows me. <laughs> <laughs> Who's a little reversible? Oh. And Cody's bad. Also logged in. Um, so who am I? Who? There's also um, in the programs that you run. So PS tells you programs. Actually, PSU will tell you what user they are. A will show you more. Let me make this a little smaller. PSUA will show you programs that are running and who's running them. So Jonathan Rice is doing a lot of work on Astro <laughs> One. <laughs> we just forgot the blog out. <laughs> huh? Or he just forgot the blog out. I don't, well, he has IRAF running. Um, I don't, yeah. The BI, I don't need the good people out there. Okay. Yeah, so, so programs can belong to users, can be run by users. When you start with your shell, it's run by your user. And this gives you certain um, powers. Unix. So one of the things about being a multi-user is not just that multiple people can log in, it also is that multiple people can keep their files separate and have some security between them. Um, so, yeah. So, so one of the ways this is done, one of the main ways since like the start of Unix, um, 
is to use the users as a uh, users and groups as a way of uh, deciding whether or not you can access a file. Since I forgot to mention it, I should say everyone also has a group. If you type ID, so your username, your group, or sorry, your username and the user ID, your group and group ID, and any other groups you belong to. Uh, for me, I just belong to Astro Group, which has an ID of 101. Groups. Sorry, did I type group and then tab. Groups tells you all the groups you belong to. So you can belong to multiple groups and have one of them as a primary. In this case, I only belong to one group. If I look on my computer, I actually belong to a lot of groups. So type ID. Joe with the user ID of 1,000. Joe with the group ID of 1,000. And I belong to a bunch of other groups with different IDs. So, yeah. So, so Unix has the concepts of groups and IDs um, for programs and for um, yeah, for programs and for files. Uh, the way this is useful is that you can decide what files are allowed to be read, written, or executed as though they're programs. By what group of people? By yourself, by people within your group, or people within the group of the file, or people who are not needed. So the way of specifying it can be a little confusing, but it's also confusing what this means for a folder. Um, so for a folder, right access does what you think it would do. You can add delete files uh, or rename them. Uh, read access also does what you would think it would do. You can um, read the list of files in a folder. Execute access is a little strange. Go back to the terminal. Let's say I make a folder. Let's say I make this folder, a file in here. Do that. I can only see the list of files in here if I have read permission. I can only do this if I have execute permission on test folder. So execute permission um, lets you access things within the folder, as well as cd into it, make it your current directory. Um, so it's strange, but it's a way of having access to folders and files in folders that you don't have read access to. So, one way to see how you have access is to use the ls command, ls-l. -l. Um, I was asked by Aditya what the first column of that means. This is kind of a schematic of it. The first letter is just what type of file it is. The next three tell you what the owner of the file can do to it. Three after that is the group. The three after that is everyone else. So read, write, execute. You can choose those permissions for the owner, the group owner, and the everyone else. So going back. back here, if I do ls-l, you see that all my folders, the things that begin with D, I can read, write, or execute. And anyone in my group can read or execute, and everyone else can read or execute. Likewise, the files I'm making, I can read or write. Anyone else can read, in the, if they're also in my group, anyone else can read. As you can see, I'm in group Joe, and or these files are group Joe, user Joe. If I go on Astro 1, 
and I do ls dash l dash home or slash home. I ask for one. This will be a lot of people. Oh, sorry. Actually, Rick has set this up differently. Or Rick has set this up differently. You have a Almost all the users are in the group users. Some of them are in the group Astro. The directories are um, same kind of permission. Everyone can read them. Um, but who can read, write, and execute are different. Um, XDNG, one of the professors, is the only one who can write in his own directory. Um, many of the usernames are just numbers, are probably deleted users. Yeah. So there's a fair amount of um, yeah. so these directories describe the um, uh, these directories have permissions to make it so that no one else can write into your home directory. But it's kind of a good system. Well, not so much if you want it to be private. Um, if you don't want anyone to read what read the list of files you have. So, actually, does anyone have a USB cable I could use? No? So I want to demonstrate, although I realize now is I don't have one, I want to go into my Android phone. And the way Android works is every application on there is a different user. So if you go to the slash data slash data folder on Android, there's a bunch of folders for each application that's owned by different users. And none of them can access the other ones. So this is one way to use the multi-user the multi aspect of Linux. Um, I'll use it, to, uh, use it for the security of your system. In that case, it's itself. Slash data slash data, uh, if you're not roots, is not readable. So you have to be roots to do that. You have to have super user access then? Yeah. It's, it, it doesn't have, um, it has executable but not read permissions for oh, slash data slash data. Okay. So a program can't see what other programs are installed. They actually take quite a bit of advantage of Linux's security for Android. So, so that is actually brings up a point. All this security stuff you can ignore if you're a super user. So the, um, the user with the user ID of zero can just ignore all these file permissions. Hence why you have to type sudo for some things that gets you that's super user do, um, or su. Uh, these are commands to run things as a super user. So keep that kind of in mind. All this is can be ignored if you're super user. For changing it, there's the chmod command has a weird syntax. Um, it's essentially octal, which is using base three. Or sorry, using um, yeah, the, the, or, uh, sorry, these are three bit numbers. So, one way to think about it is that execute permissions are one, write permissions are two, read permissions are four. And if you just add those up, that would describe how you're giving some group of people permission in a unique way. Um, this is, uh, yeah. Since the binary representation doesn't um, overlap, so for instance, if I want to give read-write permission to someone to the file using chmod, read-write permission is two plus four to six. If I want to do the similar with um, have a directory where I want to give read and execute permission, I would do that as a five. 
So it's one and four. Um, so that way you could do a number between, uh, well, between zero and seven, and it'd be unique what combination of permissions you're granting. Which is a really weird way to do it. It's concise. So test folder, let's say I want to make that. I want to make that so I can uh, I can execute it and no one else can do anything else. I would say chamalid execute is a one zero zero test folder. And if I do that, I can no longer list it. I can CD into it, even though I can't list it. And I think the file is called file one, which is empty. But I can see the file because I have execute permissions on the directory, even though I can't list the directory. Now, so if you want to access it, then you have to change that number. Right, so let's say I want to be able to list files in here again. Instead of 100, zero, zero, read is 4. So I could do 500. Zero, zero. And this would allow me permissions to read or execute, and no one else permission to do anything else. Now, when I do that, I can now list. Just a little demonstration of doing this with the file. I'll type a couple things in here. No. Oh yeah, I don't have permission to write to the directory. Oh well. And then press Control X. Yes. Enter. And now I put stuff in file one. If I run Shamali and I make it well, let's say I make it executable, readable. Yeah, executable and readable by myself. And no permissions for anyone else. So it changed color in my shell. And I could give a path to it, execute it, which doesn't work very well. And I can still read it. If I change permission to nothing, no permissions whatsoever, I can't write to it. I can't read to it to fill this in here. And if I put some random stuff in here, control X, yes. It doesn't even want me to type the same file name. Override, permission denied. So, not going to save. Let's say I gave myself read permission and nothing else. And then I could still, it warns me I'm not able to write to it, and still add more stuff. But when I go to save, that was again. So, two of the biggest places you'll see this come up. Um, well, your experience may vary, but uh, one thing that's common if you look at a place with a lot of programs like ls dash l or dash l slash bin. Almost all of these are executable permission sets. If they don't, that's bad. Um, your programs need to have executable permission for you to be able to run them. Or can't you put CS mod and then do something like this? Right. Yeah. In this case, these programs are run by the super user. But suppose if I want to do that too, then what step I need to do? For the super user? Yeah, like I don't want anyone to change. Like if I have a file and I don't want you to change. 
and then but you do CH mod and then probably access it and then change. So CH mod, that. you can only do CH mod on a file you own, while it's here the super user root. So no, actually, that's CH. Um, I think if you have write permission to it, you might be able to. Oh, we could do this. Anyone on Astro One? Yeah. So I'm going to create a file. Um, my file. I'm going to show the permissions. Okay. And where am I? I'm slash MMT slash So I'm going to chamod this so that you have write permission to it. So I'm going to do 666 so anyone can write to it. But it's probably a good thing that this is a scary number because that's <laughs> usually not what you want. Okay, now if you don't mind, if you can do chmod 000 slash mnt slash vol01 slash jbooker slash my file and then see if it works. I'm not sure if write permission is enough to change the permissions or if you have to be on your page. Okay. So it looks like I can't change the permissions. All right. So that's how it's that. If you're a root, you could. But yeah. You can't defend against root. Well, you can confuse roots, but can't defend against root. Yeah, we'll find you can. Somewhat similar system to what Windows was trying to do for a while. Okay. There is also the nice ways to put this. Um, I can change it so that others take away read writes to my file. And if I do that, the read write for others go away. Or change it so that the group can execute. And this is kind of the like less concise and easier to remember on the terminal and less rare or more rarely used in um, scripts. I don't know how much other Unixes have supported doing things like that. Using um, G plus or minus or O plus or minus. Or the alternative is um, just adding plus or minus for your own user. So that's a simpler way to do it without memorizing those. Um, the, Three bit codes. A lot in scripts. And I used it last time for. Well, let me go to the simpler one. I, I use it a lot for slash. Or I use it for. Sorry, I didn't mean to paste. I use it for slash dev slash null as just like an empty bucket to put stuff into it, never see it again. Um, but this is the interface for if you want to access hardware, you can do that without using a system call. Uh, another way to do it, another way to think about this is that 
when you use the system called a write, what you're really writing to is the file, one of the files in here. On this uh, terminal, it writes to slash dev slash console. On other computers, it'll be slash dev slash ttw. So for instance, if I echo i and redirect that to a file, on this computer, it's slash dev slash hi, or slash dev slash console. On other ones, so on Astro One, for instance, uh, who am I? It's whatever this is. So this is slash dev file system is a way to interact with equal, oh, yes. See, this is kind of useful, one of the useful things about a nice shell. Spell checks you. So spelling that correctly. Um, you can treat your console just as a file in the slash dev folder. Um, or other things in here. If I look in slash dev on Astro One, there's a mess of stuff. These are all hard drives and partitions on them. Those are all the different terminals that people have opened. Um, these are actually file systems that are not on a hard drive. Um, there's quite a bit here. These are printers. Yeah. So oh, this is one of the things that Unix really pioneered, and Plan Nine from uh, Plan Nine from Bell Labs really took off with as another operating system. The fact that you can interact with your hardware with the file system. So that's why slash dev gets used. Um, this may not be a smart thing to do. Oh, good. I'll do it to one line. But slash dev slash random, if you need to source the random, yes. That's where slash dev gets used. used with. Slash EDC is system-wide settings, so things like the list of users, the list of the passwords for the users. Um, that's not re re world readable. So for instance, all the passwords for all the users on Astro One are in this file, slash EDC slash shadow, which thankfully I can't read. Actually, no one can read, which means that only root can read, because root can ignore these permissions. Um, so the program will log you and has to run its roots. So, uh, there's a ton of different, um, basically any kind of thing that you install in the system has a configuration file put in slash EPC. So it's common to have to edit files for, here are the ones for Z-Shell, Z there are some for Bash, there are some for, um, for the GUI system on Linux. Um, your packet managers, the things to install other software, you, you can figure them in here. There's usually slash home or slash users on a Mac is where you put home the home directory is the folder you're in when you log in. On Astro One, uh, Rick puts that on a separate hard drive, which is why it's on someplace kind of unexpected when you say pwd to get slash mnt slash something. Um, but traditionally, that's what the slash home and slash users are, and that's why you'll see that in one of those two views in a lot of examples of people um, showing the commands they run. Libraries go in, go in central locations. If you have a 64-bit system, 64-bit libraries and 32-bit libraries go in separate places. If you have a 32-bit program, you can only use the 32-bit libraries. So there's a bit of split for that. Slash TMP is if you want to have some temporary storage. Um, so downloads, for instance. From Firefox, if you download something, um, it'll usually go to slash TMP. 
in Chrome, it just downloads it to your downloads folder. But slash var is kind of permanent storage, not like temp, but things like if you have a mail server, if you have uh, if you have a printer set up, the things that are going to be printed would be in slash var. Um, things that you want to keep around in case your uh, reboots. Your list of installed programs on Linux would go in slash var. USR slash local is a useful thing because it's a useful place to put things that you're installing without them conflicting with whatever Apple installs as well as whatever your distribution of Linux installs. So in well-designed software, they'll put it, well-designed software will put itself in this directory by default. And as the last thing I've kind of been glossing over, there's a lot of repetition between what's in like slash bin and slash us bin slash usr or slash usr slash lib and slash lib. Usr used to be where the um, uh, home directories would go, hence the name users directory. Uh, traditionally, the first computers that Unix were made from had very little space on the main partition the main hard drive, um, main file system, and slash USR was a different device. We don't do that anymore. Uh, Linux won't work for many distributions nowadays if you don't have slash USR right when you start up. Um, the, in, the, in the middle of that time, there was a time when slash bin would be the programs you need to start up, slash USR slash bin would be everything else, um, that's kind of been lost. A lot of things are being put in slash USR, and for instance, some distributions no longer use slash bin. It's just a link slash USR slash bin. Um, so there's a lot of things put in slash USR, but one way to think of that is it's just like a legacy folder, or it's the need for it's legacy. We put most of the things in, most of the things that are installed in there. <coughs> so if you want to put the IDE in all you can do it So if you want to put IDF slash USR slash local, unless it comes from your distribution. So if Fedora has a thing where you can install IDL, which they probably never will, they have they have standards for what they'll do, to put it nicely. Um, Fedora would, would, would not install it in slash use like local. But, yeah, any software you install yourself, separate from what Apple will do, or separate from what your distribution will do, this is the place for it. Is it a problem if you install it sometimes, like, say, application or something? So, it is a problem if you, um, it, it is a problem if you install it to say slash bin or slash user slash bin, and then Apple decides to put a program in there, or your Linux distribution decides to put a program in there that has the same name. So that, that's the reason for keeping things separate. Um, so, so you're not like conflicting your stuff and the, um, where you get your software. Any other questions? Okay, so that just that finishes it up. Um, <coughs> this little bunch of things that I haven't talked about. I should say slash USR has some other folders, slash USR slash share particularly has the um, has all the icons and uh, desktop shortcuts and basically data that programs use go in slash USR. Um, so, massive stuff. Um, or slash USR slash local slash share if you're installing your own software that has all that. So, I 
that I have, have a couple um, references of interesting uh, things on the internet. This explained shell, kind of a cool looking thing. If you type in something complicated, like let's say I do this, ask it to explain, and it tells you like each part of the thing you typed in, like the documentation for it. So kind of a nice tool. Um, nice tool for seeing what commands do before you actually run them. Uh, Sulfur Carpentry is actually a project slash series of workshops uh, for teaching computing skills to scientists. Uh, so they have a thing on learning the shell that goes into more um, how to make scripts and the use of scripts. And then there's a crash course that seems interesting, if a little less and holdy. These have a lot more, software carpentry have a lot more of, um, you're a scientist with this data, how do you use what you just learned to, or how, do you, how does what you just learned help you? Um, a lot of narratives like that. So. so. Including some programming. Uh, they have programming stuff on there too. Two three weeks. Oh. Um, is a Python one? There is later on. Uh, in two three weeks, it's. Um, it's using the version control software, which is. I have actually opened the home page quite a lot, which is actually a way of organizing how you how you're writing code, how you're writing any kind of text. Um, as well as how you're uh, keeping track of your history of, of changes you've made, keeping track of history other people have made. Um, and basically, this is like decades of work of trying to be as lazy and productive as you can at the same time um, and having tools to support you to do that. Essentially tools to let you, um, tools to replace saving file underscore version one, file underscore version two. Um, so this is a website which is kind of growing in use among astronomers and among people in uh, the open source community in general, particularly, more than astronomers, um, where you can not only share code, but share the changes that have been made, who's made the changes. Um, that was a really small change. But uh, a lot of documentation changes. As well as coordinate um, or any potential changes, uh, coordinate development of software. Um, so that's what the next ones will be about. Um, being able to organize your own software developments, as well as you could organize your resume. Any kind, any kind of text that you say. Um, and being able to collaborate with people with these tools. So. For instance, this is someone saying they can speed up distances with massive neutrinos in this astronomy code. And providing the um, 
providing the code changes required to do that in a way that makes it easy to makes it easy for the people that everyone else trusts with the code to see the changes, see the um, be able to compare the different levels of it, be able to review it nicely, um, and be able to keep track of the history later on and merge them with changes even when there's been other changes in the meantime since this person has written this code. So maybe that was a little long than I did. <laughs> but it, it's basically uh, tools for organizing data. Use particularly for code. Programmers are lazy and they make things easy for themselves. But it works for other things.